As an example, 35 years old male is hospitalized with symptoms as weakness, persistent fever and diffuse lymph node enlargement. Lab results show significant leukocytosis 96 with circulating lymphoblasts. Blood urea, nitrogen, creatinine and uric acid are normal, lactic dehydrogenase 3000 significantly elevated, potassium, calcium, phosphorus are normal, also ECG is normal. Chest X-ray revealed mediastinal mass, bone marrow aspirate shows significant infiltration by blood cells 80% and flow cytophilometry shows specific markers of T-cells acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia is diagnosed, which is basically quite uncommon in adults. Also specific feature of acute lymphoblastic leukemia is high elected dehydrogenase level, which basically show high tumor burden. By this term we mean high amount of cancer cells, in our example blast cells. And acute lymphoblastic leukemia needs aggressive chemotherapy. And when chemotherapy was given, on the next day patient feel unwell and complains on irregular heartbeat and nausea. ECG shows premature ventricular beats, leukocyte scan substantially decreased from 96 to 46, blood urea and nitrogen increased from 4 to 16, creatinine increased by 3 times, also uric acid became substantially higher. Lactic dehydrogenase level also increased from 3000 to 10,000 units per liter. There is also changes in electrolyte level, potassium increased from 4 to 6.5, Calcium decreased to 1.5 and phosphorus level increased, so it's tumor lysis syndrome which is potentially a deadly complication of tumor treatment. Tumor lysis syndrome is caused by breakdown of malignant cells. What happens is that chemotherapy causes lysis of cancer cells and when they die they release intracellular content to the bloodstream. It's first of all cellular DNA and also intracellular ions as potassium and phosphorus. Let's start from DNA. DNA is degraded to nucleic acids as adenosine, inosine, guanosine and guanine. Adenosine and inosine metabolize it first to hypoxanthine and then all of them by enzyme xanthine oxidase metabolize to xanthine and again by xanthine oxidase to uric acid which is the end product of nucleic acid degradation. And in tumor lysis syndrome there is increase in DNA degradation and this will cause increase in uric acid level so hyperuricemia develops. And we see that uric acid increase from 400 to 600 so there is hyperuricemia. And the problem with uric acid is that uric acid precipitates in renal tubules with uric acid crystals formation. And this uric acid crystal deposition occurs predominantly in collecting tubules because it's the site of the lowest pH. And in acid environment uric acid becomes less soluble, so solubility decrease, thereby its precipitation increase. And this leads to increase in crystals formation. And this uric acid crystals cause diffuse acute tubular injury accompanied by inflammation and obstruction of renal tubules. And this damage to renal tubules results in increase in creatinine and also in blood urea nitrogen level. And we see that there is elevation in creatinine and blood urea nitrogen level that is caused by acute tubular injury. Also with slices of cancer cells intracellular ions released, one of them is phosphorus, so there will be massive release of phosphorus to the bloodstream. But because phosphorus is negative charge ion, it binds and precipitates calcium with formation of calcium phosphate. So phosphorus level will remain high due to massive intracellular phosphorus release. So there will be hyperphosphatemia, but calcium level in the blood decrease, so hypocalcemia develops. And with hypocalcemia there is increased risk for arrhythmias and also hypocalcemia may cause hypotension and heart failure. Hypotension and heart failure develops because sarcoplasmic reticulum is unable to maintain adequate calcium level to initiate myocardial contraction. So myocardial contractility decrease, so cardiac output will decrease and with decrease in cardiac output heart failure develops. Also because blood pressure is equal to cardiac output on heart rate this decrease in cardiac output, hypotension develops. This calcium phosphate can precipitate throughout the body. For example, it can precipitate in renal tubules with development of acute tubular injury like urate crystals. But also if calcium phosphate precipitates in cardiac conducting system, there is increased risk of fatal arrhythmias. Another intracellular ion is potassium. So there is massive release of potassium to the blood 
And with increased potassium level, there is also increased risk for arrhythmias. Also, potassium level increases, so hyperkalemia develops. And also on ECG, we see that there is premature ventricular beats, primarily due to electrolyte changes. And we already mentioned that elevated lactate dehydrogenase level is also a specific feature of acute leukemias. This marker is usually used to assess tissue breakdown. In our case, initially elected dehydrogenase level is elevated due to high quantity of cancer cells that have increased rate of proliferation and turnover. But after chemotherapy, elected dehydrogenase level became even higher due to destruction of cancer cells. That's why high elected dehydrogenase level is associated with acute leukemia, because acute leukemias are very rapidly proliferating tumors. Overall, tumor lysis syndrome occurs when release of tumor cells intracellular content is higher than body's clearance mechanism can deal with. That's why tumor lysis syndrome is associated with rapidly proliferating tumors as acute leukemia, Burkitt lymphoma or diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And also tumor lysis syndrome is associated with high-grade tumors because the amount of cancer cells is high, so the greater quantity of intracellular content will be released with their destruction. But the most important role in tumor lysis syndrome plays in renal clearance mechanisms, because if kidney is able to excrete all of this intracellular content, clinical tumor lysis syndrome is unlikely to develop, so everything depends on the ability of kidney to excrete all of this released intracellular content. That's why patients with pre-existing renal impairment or renal involvement by the tumor have higher risk of developing tumor lysis syndrome. But even initially healthy kidney can prevent developing of tumor lysis syndrome, because progressive deposition of urease and calcium phosphate crystals leads to progressive decrease in kidney function. So to protect kidney and prevent tumor lysis syndrome, there is two key points. First of all, it's hydration to improve renal perfusion, and also with forced diuresis to prevent crystals deposition and precipitation. The same principles that is used, for example, in rhabdomyolysis with myoglobinuria. Allopurinol is xanthine oxidase inhibitor, and with inhibition of xanthine oxidase, conversion of hypoxanthine to xanthine and xanthine to uric acid is decreased. So uric acid formation will decrease, but the level of uric acid precursors will increase. The logic is that hypoxanthine and xanthine are more soluble than uric acid. And because they are more soluble, their precipitation rate is lower, so the lower will be the rate of crystals formation. But the problem with allopurinol is that it does not increase the rate of breakdown of uric acids that has already released to the bloodstream, so therapeutic effect is delayed by 1-3 to three days. Resburicase is a recombinant form of enzyme urate oxidase, which is absent in human organism. And urate oxidase can convert uric acid to allantoin, which is substantially more soluble substance than uric acid. It's extremely effective drug because it acts immediately on already formed urate, and with IV infusion, resburicase can reduce plasma uric acid level within 4 hours. Also, there was a method of urine alkalization that was based on the point that with increased pH, uric acid became more soluble. But the problem is that xanthine and hypoxanthine and also calcium phosphate became less soluble. So for now, alkalization diuresis is not recommended.